So before we go to our, pre our presentation, I'd like to ask all participants um, to please make sure you're muted. I think you already are. And if you have any questions, kindly use the Q&A uh, function, or you can also send a chat, send a chat privately if you need to, or just send a chat in the chat box. And introduce yourselves. Let us know who's on the pa or who's in the um, in the webinar. Thank you very much again. My name is Engineer Elizabeth Rogo. I'm the president of the of East Africa for the African Energy Chamber, as well as the CEO of Savo Oil Field Services. I have my guest moderator today. Ms. Susan Munyori, who's a local content manager with Talo Oil Kenya. We're both very, very excited um, to, uh, to have you in this presentation. Seems that I'm having a, sorry. Sorry, I think we're having a bit of a problem here. One moment. I'm not seeing all my slides. Ah, can somebody help me here? Ah, there we are. So our panelists today um, consists of Lynette Nyaga, who's a, petroli who's a, pet a chemical engineer by training and the project lead and cementing engineer. We have Phyllis Mathenge, drilling engineer with Geothermal Development Company. Hayat Sharif, who's a petroleum engineer and just recently graduated. She was also the president for the SPE KU student chapter in, in 2018. Um, Audrey Mulama, who's a mining engineer and was the award winner for innovation for the Energy 4i, and we'll talk a little bit about that during her presentation. And last but last not least, the only man in the panel, uh, Arthur Kisaka, who is a petroleum engineering student at Kenyatta University and is the current president for SPEKU. This, this is our wonderful panel, and I know we're going to have a fantastic uh, introduction. Um, before we go to them, I'd like to introduce you a little bit to who Africa Energy Chamber is, for those who don't know. The African Energy Chamber is the voice of Africa's energy sector. We're also the leading chamber of successful networks, transactions, and partnerships at the helm of Africa's growing energy industries. The Africa Energy Chamber, together with its regional presidents, actively promotes the interest of the African continent, its companies, and its people. And we're very, very lucky to have a, a fantastic executive chairman, NJ Ayuk, who's also the founder of the Africa Energy Chamber. I'll just talk a little bit about the current initiatives that we're going to, we, that are under, undergoing. And uh, one of our big ones, and the latest one, is the AEC membership drive. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of it in social media. I urge you to go to the um, energy chamber org slash members slash benefits to see to understand and register for for this ongoing membership drive there'll be a lot of information there that will help you decide which package you should get and i urge everybody uh, this will make sure that uh, as an organization we are there to to support you we are a non-profit foundation so anything that we do get at least helps us run uh, this very successful chamber the other initiative that we have been running uh, or, in, or are involved in is the Equal by 30 campaign. And this is a, a global campaign. And again, was initiated by the Centurion Law Group with respect to companies in, in Africa. So Centurion Law Group, Savo Oil Field Services, Apex Industries out of Equatorial Guinea and the Africa Oil and Power, um, I would say are the core of the African uh, companies that have joined this wonderful campaign. So for those of you who are here who own companies, who obviously work with companies, I urge you to go and look up Equal by 30 campaign. We promise and we, we want to have equal pay, equal leadership and equal opportunities for, for everybody. The young lady that you see there in the picture, Rosa Dongo, I'm very proud to have her as one of my staff. She's a petroleum engineer out of, out of um, Malaysia and has been doing wonderful things uh, in addition to the panel, the panel, the panelists that we'll be seeing. 
We also have for you a common sense energy agenda. There's a profile or a bulletin, um, and we're going to give you a, a Dropbox link that you can go in after this webinar and access some of this very useful information. The agenda looks at, um, looks at common sense against COVID-19 as well as the oil price war. And last but not least is management and safety guidelines. These are the advisory guidelines for the management and safety of oil workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. These are just a few of, of the fascinating and fantastic things that are going on at the Africa Energy Chamber. So I urge you to please go to the website, please reach out to any one of your regional presidents here in Africa, I am here, and we're here to, to support you. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Norwell Edge. Norwell Edge is a, is a fascinating e-learning platform that comes out of uh, Aberdeen. And um, I'm really pleased to see that they, um, they've sponsored this first of our youth, um, of our young professional um, webinars. And we're very, very grateful for their generous um, sponsorship. So they'll be handing out 10 vouchers worth $200. Of that, five of them will go to our panelists. And we're also going to do a mini lottery between um, Norwell Edge and myself, uh, i.e. the AEC, and we'll advise the five winners that have won. The, if you go into the Norwell Edge website, you'll see that it's very, very competitively priced, 20 to $50 uh, for each course. And uh, times per course is from one to three hours. You also have nine hours available of uh, free training, and that's uh, approximately three courses. I'd like to urge every young professional who's in attendance, if you can please let us know um, who you are, please put in your email address in the chat box. We will compile all those um, uh, email addresses and make sure that we give them to the Norwell Edge uh, people. And just a very quick overview of Mike Adams. I think a lot of you know Mike Adams. He's attended um, some of our previous webinars. He's the co-founder of Norwell Edge. And I'd just like to say that the Edge platform that he has created with his wonderful team is the first in the world to offer the full OG UK Wells curriculum alongside continuously evolving new training technology. And what is also very, fasc very fascinating and good about their platform is that they have this link with Norwell en Engineering. And Norwell Engineering is like the mothership and it assures te technical integrity at the heart of all their courses. And they'll keep checking their courses against what is happening in the real world. Thank you so much, Mike Adams, if you've joined us. We really appreciate your kind, uh, um, your kind sponsorship. I'd like to take this time to introduce Susan Munyori, who is my co-moderator for this session, and she'll be taking over after this uh, short introduction as to who Susan is. So I know Susan very well, wonderful lady. She's very well respected here in Kenya. She's an internationally skilled in-country value expert with over 20 years of experience. I won't read through, through, I won't read her whole biography, but if you read, you can see this is a fascinating lady who has worked for Shell Oil Products Africa, capacity building manager for Sub-Sahara at AMSCO. She's now um, the local content manager at Talo Kenya, where she's established local content policies. And these policies have helped drive what you're going to see with regards to youth, as well as companies such, such as myself, uh, Savo Oilfield, Bentworth, uh, Lakeford. We have all had to rely on these local content policies. Uh, Susan is also a board member of AWAC, and she's also uh, representing oil and gas and is a lead in the extractive subcommittee of the local content working group at KEPSA. And she holds an MBA degree or an MBA degree from uh, Nairobi. So at this time, Susan, I'd like to hand over to you to take over on the panelists' presentations. And we will also have a quick SPE survey that was undertaken by Arthur Kitaka. Thank you. Thank you very much, Engineer Elizabeth. If you're having trouble, you want me to pull it up? Uh, yeah, I will, I will, I will be able to pull it up. I think that's all right. That's visible, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth, again. 
uh, for the kind introduction. Um, in line with our theme today, which is to what extent are the voices of young professionals incorporated in the extractive sector? We have the best presenters uh, pulled together today to run with, the, with, this, uh, with this theme. And uh, these young professionals are exceptional in their areas of expertise. They are super achievers with outstanding credentials. They will be telling us about their experiences in their respective sectors, citing where challenges have been encountered, and as well share solutions they think can help other young professionals. Um, we mentioned the extractive sector. Geothermal energy is a natural heat stored within the Earth's crust. The energy is manifested on the Earth's surface in the form of fumaroles, hot springs, and hot altered grounds. To extract this energy, wells are drilled at high temperatures and high pressures and with, uh, great, uh, with deep depths. Um, currently, Kenya is top seven amongst the global geothermal producers with over 800 megawatts. I will stop here because I'm no expert in this area and introduce our first panelist. That is engineer Phyllis Mathenge. Phyllis is an inspirational young professional who has had a phenomenal career in geothermal. I will be inviting her shortly to tell us more about her experiences in the geothermal sector and also share some words of wisdom. Engineer Phyllis, you're most welcome. Good evening and welcome to this presentation. My name is Phyllis Gadoni Madenge. I am a drilling engineer with Geothermal Development Company. I have been in this position for about six years. Prior to being a drilling engineer, I was a rig maintenance engineer where I worked in the same company for about a year. I am very passionate about women and girls empowerment. And in this line, I am lucky to be the Kenyan ambassador for WING. And WING is a group for women in geothermal in Africa. And this group is global. And we do a lot of things for women. We connect, we network and we mentor each other so that we can be able to achieve better and more. I studied electrical and electronics engineering at the University of Nairobi and added a master's in project planning and management, which has helped me to be who I am. I would say that this has been a very exciting job from my end, and I really do love what I do. And what do I do? I, I am a drilling engineer, and I double that as a drilling supervisor. I am currently working at the Baringo uh, project in Parker Hills, where we are drilling uh, exploration wells. We are drilling the third exploration well. At the moment, we are about 2,900 meters. I have previously worked in other projects in Menengai Crater in Nakuru. I, am, I also double as a drilling supervisor, where I supervise a team of about uh, 20 people. Our end product after drilling is steam, which is in turn used to produce electricity and um, other direct uses. My job is fun and I love it. And I always get a chance to take a photo or two so that I can show around. And so that, this makes me happy. So these two photos is one is a group of um, my team members who took a photo. This was about two years ago in a project we were doing a rig move. And the other one is in a project. I was just sitting down and laughing over a tea break with my team members. Because of how much I love women, girls, empowerment, advancement, moving forward, helping each other, I am a member of WING. I would say I am a WING, I'm a woman in geothermal. And while I act, or I be, when, and while I act as the Kenyan ambassador, I feel very privileged to be able to interact with so many different people to advance and to grow each one of us. The photo to your right is a photo that we took in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia while we were doing the African Rift Geothermal Conference. And the one to your right is a photo of me at the driller's cabin. I don't know if I'm audible, am I? Yes, yes, you are. Yes, Susan. you are. Susan, yes. Yes. can you please expand your screen? Um, we're trying to contact you, but you're not. Ah, right, right, right. Is everything visible, though? 
It is, but we need to expand the screen. Yes, much, much better. And okay. Philip, you're, you're good. Continue, please. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can move on, Phyllis. So today I'll be talking about challenges that we are facing as young professionals. And uh, these challenges I'll be particular, I'll be talking about some of the things that I have as a woman gone through and as a drilling engineer. So while at our project, we engage a lot with our community members. And in the current project we are, we have supplied some water to them, therefore being, uh, being able to reach SDG goal five, which, which talks about affordable, which talks about clean water. Now, the most exciting part of this project or what I do is to be able to interact with people while making Kenya green, while making, doing best in what I do, to be able to reach and touch the lives of the community. It's a good thing and I feel good about it. And I enjoy much talking with women and interacting with them. So the photo on your screen is a photo of some of my team members and the community members where we were having a light moment discussing the project and what we were going to do. The challenges that we are facing as young professionals are many. I'll be talking about some of the ones that I have faced as a young professional. While there are so many things that we are going through as young professionals, I'll just narrow down to just a few, which I think are important and that I have experienced directly. And I hope that the panelists, other panelists are going to talk about the rest. And the fact I'm going to talk, the first I'm going to talk about is transitioning for, of educa from education to employment. It's very interesting that most of us are very academically qualified, but we lack the link between transitioning from what you studied in school and being able to use to apply it at your place of work and being able to do what you learned. I'll tell you a practical example. While I was at the University of Nairobi, I studied electrical and electronic engineering. I interned in two places. One was the city council of Nairobi, where I where I interned for a couple of months. And the second one was at the then communication uh, CCK, I think it's now called CAK. And I felt very empowered and ready and a lot, I learned a lot of things. But then I got employed at GDC as a rig maintenance engineer. And things were different. It, 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 I hadn't known that whatever I needed or whatever I was thinking in my mind or the solutions that I needed, I needed to communicate to other people. I didn't know exactly how to communicate them. Sometimes the solution or the challenge we were going through, the solution I had in my mind was what worked when we solved it. And then I would think, why didn't I communicate it? But it's, I, I didn't know how to go about it. I didn't know how to communicate. So the some of the skills that we lack so that we can be able. I didn't know how to negotiate myself around so that I can get the best deal, but I worked on it. The second challenge that we go through or young professionals are going through is not being hired. Well, we are not completely uh, neglected. We are being hired, but not enough. You work in a team where there is a team of older people who, have, who are used to working in a certain way and you come in as a young person. They can do the job in half the time that you could do it or even Three, uh, even a third of the time that you could do it. And therefore you joining the team sometimes might pull them back in terms of time. But then you have to balance. So how do you learn and how do you incorporate? How do you make your voice heard? How do you tell them that you need to learn and that if you learned this, then you'd be able to work faster? How do you do that? Sometimes you get forgotten in a team. I work in a team of, um, in my department, we are about 23 drilling engineers and we are about two ladies. I am the first and the only lead drilling engineer at the moment in my company. And sometimes you get forgotten. Sometimes the men will make decisions for the women, about women, concerning women, without consulting you, and they will think it's a favor. It's funny because in their mind they think they're helping you. But are they? I mean, if you're available, should you be consulted? But then again, are you, are you bringing yourself so that you're consulted or so that, or so that your input is needed or is taken care of? Those are some of the other challenges I faced. The other challenge I've gone through is self-sabotage. I can tell you for a fact that I feel at one point I have sabotaged myself in my success. Yeah? So at how many times do you feel like you're not ready or enough for a job? So that there's this thing that you need to do, but you call yourself to a meeting and you're like, I don't think I'm ready. I, I, I'm not, maybe I'll do it next time. And then maybe the opportunity just passes. 
How many times do you neglect yourself so that you just work, work, work nonstop and you do not take a minute to replenish your mental health so that you can be able to perform better? How many times do you take a pause? Do you ever take a pause at your place of work so that you're able to look back and see this is how far I have come. This is where I need to go. This is where I am. Is it working? Is it not working? Because if you are, if whatever you're doing is not working, then you continue moving in direct direction. You are standing in your own way, in the own of your own success. How many times have you done that? How many times have you been given a job and you felt it is difficult and you are like, oh my God, why did they give me this one? Now you're just beating yourself. Yeah. And I'll give you an example. Yeah. Sometimes you're given a job and you are back in the village, like while I'm doing this webinar, I mean, at my hometown in Naromoru, and uh, we have some issues with internet, and we have some issues with electricity connectivity. I could have as well said, uh, you know, now I'm in the village, now there's no internet, I'll probably fail, and then not do it. And I, by the way, it crossed my mind. I thought about it. And I was like, no, I can do this, I can do this, whatever comes, go with me. So how many times have you stood on your way as a person? Are you able to contain that thought so that the positive one wins? Yeah. There are so many things that we're going through. So what are the solutions that I'm bringing to the table? I have sorted my solutions into two. Solutions that organizations can do and solutions that I, as a young professional, can do. So I'll start with solutions that I feel organizations can come around and do. And the first one is to equip more youth with employability and life skills. I can tell you for a fact and from experience that technical competence is not the only competence you need. No. You need to look good. You need to speak well. You need to communicate well. You need to be able to negotiate. You need to be able to do other things. Yeah. Can you even serve tea without just clean heart? Can you serve tea? Yeah. Can you help someone from the bottom of your heart? Can you bring five people together when you have a challenge and be able to solve it? Can you be the, the person that is going to start that? Those are some of the things. And webinars like this one, thank you to the organizers, must be where we start. So that we talk about the skills and we tell people that you need to communicate. This is how you go about it. And if you feel you're not ready, this is the person you see. Because help is out there. And help is there for us to get. The second solution I want to talk about is to ensure that the youth access meaningful work experience. I have heard a lot of stories about young professionals and going for internships. And then they are given paperwork. You know, some of us as employed people are so selfish that the work you do not want to do is what you give the intern. Yeah? You do not want to go with the intern to feel that so that they actually experience what they need to do, but you want them to be left behind and arrange books and your files yeah? and dust them to do this. So are we giving them meaningful experience? Are they actually doing the job when they are with us? Are we even going a step and providing those internships? Because some do not, there is a shortage of internships. Are they even getting them? Are we offering professional networks? And I, as a young person in this forum, are you taking the advantage so that you consider this one the network that you require so that you can move? Are you following it up? And that's a, and the last solution I'm going to give is to provide our young professionals with career advice, information, and guidance. It's not enough that you get into a job, yeah? Someone higher than you it would be much easier. While you will still get to the pop, it will still be much easier if someone held your hand and told you that if you go this way, this will work. But it's two way. The person who is mentoring must be ready and you, the mentee, must be available and ready to learn. Are you even ready to learn? Yeah? So the second set of solutions I am going to give are solutions that touch on us as young professionals. So what is it that us as young professionals can do so that we make ourselves more better, more marketable, and so that we can be reached out to by people and by organizations? The first one is communication. In a world where a lot is going on, do you listen? And when you listen, do you listen to understand 
Do you listen to answer? Do you even remember a day after what you were told? Or is it just a passing cloud? Very important. And when you do, and you have a concern, do you speak up? How do you speak up? How do you bring about your point so that you get the assistance that you need without offending people and without appearing to be complaining all the time? Because I can assure you, complaining is boring. And no one likes to be around a complainer. So how do you bring up your challenge so that people are willing and available to help you without complaining all the time? Do you ever advocate for yourself? If there was a webinar like this one that was to be arranged and you are asked which of your ladies or which of your gentlemen is best to participate, would you bring your name forward? Would you? Or would you be the person referring other people and never ever fronting yourself? Are there people in your organization that can champion for you? Do you have friends that can, can vouch for you and say, this is a good person, Madenge is a good person, and she can do the job? Do you? The second solution is to talk about brand, to build you, to grow you. Sometimes we have to fill our cups so that we can give. While we agree that technical competence is not the only competence we need, what are these other competencies that you need? We must, as young professionals, align ourselves with the industries that we are in so that that industry, you realize what it is that they require, what must you do, what must, not you, what must you not do, or what must you put more effort in. It's going to help you. Do you ever do that? That's something that you must work on. And that work is personal. No amount of webinar, no amount of help, no amount of mentorship can help you until you decide as a human being that either the way I'm here, I need to get to point B, and this is what I need to do. Then you start seeking for help. Are you preparing yourself for the future of work? Do you even know what is the future of work in your industry? Do you know where you're going? And then are you preparing? Or are you just thinking of your village? or your country as Kenya, or your county as Kericho, or your, your continent as Africa, don't you know that you can work in the US, in Italy, in Asia, in China, wherever? You can work anywhere. With the skill set that you have, your skill sets are global. Are you preparing yourself for that? Because that is the future of work, and that is the kind of thing that we must do. What kind of connections and networks are you building? Are your friends just there to call you to go for Nyamachoma? Or are they the kind of people who, when there is a scholarship, they send you the link because they need you to apply? Are they the kind of people, the next one, the networks who sent you this link and that is why you're here? Or are they the kind of links, the kind of people, the kind of networks who only call you when there's a wedding, when there's a burial, or when there's a party? And all those things are good, but what's in for you? Because you, we are all social beings, but we must remember, we must never neglect our, our professionalism. So how is that growing? How many people are surrounding you? What is your net worth? If you are to look at your five best friends, what are they bringing to the table? What are they giving you? And the last thing I want to talk about is to embrace technology. If I may ask, if you are to Google yourself, what would be the outcome? Would you like what you see? I don't know. I, I probably will Google myself after this so that I, I, I find out if I may like what I see. But would you like what you see if you Google? If you looked, if I looked at your social media as a geothermal expert, and I was looking for an expert to employ, and I looked at your Facebook, would it tell about you? Would it be about your values? Or is it something that would you want to see? Are you using LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram and other social media platforms to be able to build yourself? Yeah? Are you building your networks? Are you making yourself visible virtually and in person? So that while I have met my Madam Elizabeth today, Engineer Elizabeth today, virtually, then tomorrow I might want to build to meet her physically. Are we doing that or are we stopping at this and moving forward and, and going back to where we were yesterday? Are you using the information that you've gotten? During these times of COVID-19, we have not been able to travel much. 
what skill have you added? There are so many online platforms where you can run a new skill. What have you learned? If I was to check your YouTube, what is the last 10 things you checked on your YouTube? Is there any one out of 100 things that has added a skill to your life? How are you using your technology to help you, to develop you, to accelerate your growth so that you can become a better person? Those are some of the solutions that I feel that we can do as young people to be able to get better. And while we work in, uh, in uh, SDGs, which is leading, in S uh, the 17 SDGs are towards sustainable uh, development. SDG number 13 talks about climate action. And as geothermists, we are working to see that we do not just rely on fossil, but we are trying to have clean energy. And therefore, as we go through the tide where the oil and gas is not doing as well, you must know that you're, while you might be dispensable, you have been given the power to read, to open your mind, and to be diverse. You can do something else with the same skill. Yeah? We are young people, we are open-minded, and we must work towards moving to the next thing. If one thing does not work, move to the next. And while you're doing that one thing, be the best at what you do. Be the greatest. Be the goat at that thing. Thank you. That is the end of my presentation. You can reach me on my email, and let's link up on social media, Ravoni Mavenge, on all my pages. Thank you. Thank you. Thank very you. Sorry, thank you, Phyllis. I just want to make a, a quick comment. Sorry, Susan. Um, we need to ask the rest of the panelists, please stick within your seven minutes range that we had agreed to. I know the presentation, you have a lot to say. Phyllis, everybody wanted to see your face, so that's why I had to stop this. So they know who's talking. Um, we will see everybody at the discussion stage. So sorry, Susan, can we go back into the sharing? Back to you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Liz, for that. And uh, Phyllis, thank you very much for that uh, passionate presentation. I think you have made appeals to both companies and to the young professionals on how best uh, they can position themselves to, ha to have their voices heard and for the companies to present opportunities for the young professionals. So thank you for that. So we'll move on to our next presenter. And uh, I'm not sure she needs much of an introduction. Um, I'm just trying to coordinate um, everything. Yeah, there we go. Uh, engineer Lynette Nyaga. Um, Lynette is su another successful young professional in her own right. She works for a local successful company and has had the unique opportunity of creating her niche while working with service companies in oil and gas um, operators, both in East and West Africa. She also won the Young Achiever of the Year Award in 2019 during the Excellence in Extractives Recognition Awards. Lynette, I do not want to take any more of your five to seven minutes, so go ahead. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Susan said, my name is Lynette Nyaga. I am a chemical engineer by profession, having studied at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. I am currently the project lead of uh, Bentworth Energy. I previously worked also as a cementing engineer in Baker Hughes. I also hold the position of being a student liaison officer at um, SPE Nairobi section. Um, at Bentworth Energy, I, I can condense what I do in four main parts. I work with people where I ensure that the people we work with are competent, they are fit to work, and that everyone who comes to our work site returns home the, the same way they came, and therefore healthy, no accidents, no incidences. I also work uh, with equipment where I ensure that they are well maintained and fit to use for the particular project that we would have. I work with chemicals from the sourcing stage up until testing and when we're working with the client, I ensure that the chemicals have reached the quantity and the specifications are set out by an engineer and also approved by the client. With all these inputs, I work to ensure that um, we 
we provide something, we provide a service that is competitive, a service that uh, reaches the quality, uh, quality standards, and also a service that we, provide, we perform a service that is safe. Um, the photos that you can see there are from the field. Something that I love doing and wh why I love doing my job is that I love solving problems. Every well has its own set of challenges. And being able to optimize all the inputs that I have mentioned so that we can provide a quality service safely and cost efficient is something that I love doing. And it gets me up. It's something that gets me up in the morning. I also love knowing that what we do directly impacts people. Whether it's putting food on their table, the best thing you can see is stirring up a passion and a, and a career in someone else's life. So those are some of the things that I love doing. Having um, worked in, having been a professional and worked in the oil and gas industry for six years and in Bentworth for four of the six years, I have been able to see three main challenges that young professionals, students, and graduates normally face. One of them, as Phyllis had also mentioned, is transitioning into the industry. What we find is you can find a graduate, someone who has finished, someone who has their, their living certificate, but has never seen a rig before. They don't know what a cementing unit is. They don't know, they don't know in, like, anything um, pertaining to the practical aspects. They have the theoretical, what they've learned in the books, but they can't apply it anywhere. And it becomes such a huge, it, be, it becomes such a huge problem because they are not able to grasp and also marry what they learned theoretically to what they can actually apply. And it becomes a challenge to them. Something else are uh, soft skills. We know that when we are applying for a job, the first thing we are going to do is maybe have a telephone interview, and then a face-to-face. -face. And all this means that your soft skills, your communication skills, the way you present yourself are what will come out first. In as much as you're technically sound, if you're not able to articulate what you learned, if you're not able to articulate what you think, it will, and it won't come out the way you would want to, it means that you'll be selling yourself short. And what that means is that you might actually lose an opportunity that you would have gotten. And we find this a lot, especially when you are conducting interviews, it is a challenge that we have seen um, many graduates face. And it becomes harder for them to transition into the industry. Something else is um, inadequate mentorship. Um, we learn a lot in school, technically, the soft skills, but there are a lot of interpersonal skills that one needs to learn. Um, even at a working level, when you're entry-level engineer in the oil and gas industry, when I started, I, I was employed and a few months, we got the first oil deal. And it was such a crazy um, time because you're just hearing that people are going to be laid off and you don't know your fate and you're an entry-level engineer. And what, what helped was that I was able to have someone who was able to guide me and able to also show me that this is something that happens in the industry. At times we would need, we need mentors, we need people who are able, who have gone ahead of you, who are able to show you and tell you about some shortcomings even in the industry, able to prepare you better, able to, able to make you package yourself better. The other, the other part would be the expectations from graduates. Everyone who graduates expects their own different things um, from the industry. Um, we, what we find is many people who have done petroleum engineering will only apply for oil and gas jobs only. They will not look beyond that. They will not look, they will also maybe um, scale their job search into only upstream. They will not remember there's midstream and there's downstream. They will also maybe only apply for jobs in operator companies. They will forget that there are also service companies and there are also other companies that feed into the bigger, into the bigger industry. And therefore narrowing themselves. And now, so if they've not cast your, your net wide, you might get very little. And that's something that graduates also do. 
Something else is there is the notion that being in the oil and gas industry, you get um, there is you get your rewards are more, and therefore as an entry level engineer, that's what they come with. They come with a mindset that they want to be paid so much money, and then they lose sight that as an in, as an entry level engineer and you start is you should be able to be willing to learn. You should learn and you, your, your, your key thing should be learning and growth. So you, you, you should not really be thinking about the money, but you should be thinking about how best should you learn and grow from this company and grow from other people so that you can be able to be that, that you know, the engineer that you would want to be. And therefore, when you, when you lose focus, from what is very what is important, you will lose focus also on your career, and it will start becoming shaky. Um, some of the solutions that I have seen, uh, low hanging fruits, and things that we have I have incorporated and we have incorporated within Bedforth are having a structured internship program. So when you have an when you have an intern come in. And you can even purpose to have an intern come in. For every project you have, have an intern. Also, it depends on the scope of the project. You can have at least one intern, depending on the scope. But having a structured internship program really helps. Because what it does is it will give the intern, the student, expectations and what they will learn throughout the whole program. And also, you will know what to expect. Susan, we seem to be having trouble with uh, Lynette's presentation. The intern has, has the intern learned what they need to do? What they need to do. The other part is also having a competency program for entry level engineers. And this means that um, for entry level engineers, same thing, have a competency program so that they can also know so that their work is not just clerical work. They also have work where they do technical work and technical work that was meaningful. The other thing that we saw helps is supporting final year students in their project. So, the, for example, is we had a final year student who, who was an intern previously, and we ha he had created interest in what we do in cementing. Therefore, so therefore, what happened is that um, we were able to support his project by purchasing of the raw materials, by, um, by giving him the technical support, so the lab supervisor, and also by availing the lab and he was able to run and do his experiments in the lab. And what happened was he, his project was able to be the best project in his class last year. So also doing that cre create linkages between industry and academia because his project was really directly linked to what we do. And it gave us a different perspective of what we look at because technically he was looking at local bentonite and asking the question, why don't we use local bentonite? Why can't we apply it currently than importing bentonite? So that, that's something that can be done. The other thing would be supporting student organizations. So, create, so financial support, helping student clubs like SPE, the university chapters, monetary, with monetary, uh, monetarily, so that they are able to help the other students who maybe the, the company can't reach, the industry is not able to reach, the younger students, the first years, the second years, creating awareness. Also, talks and presentations to these companies, both technically, for them to know what, as industry, what we do, what really happens in the field, and also giving them awareness on soft skills so that they can actually know it's equally important for them to start honing in on soft skills, on their soft skills. Also, sponsorship opportunities. When we have webinars like this, whether when we have uh, conferences, the webinars, it will be good to sponsor some students. They come and they, they get exposed. They get exposed to see what people actually do out there. How do people network? 
how do how, which companies are actually industry players other than the ones maybe they just know something else that i realized is an organizational structure the organizational structure really matters having a bottoms up approach and not necessarily a top bottom approach where what this does is that communication is normally enhanced where every employee feels like their voice is heard and what this also does is it creates a sense of value where every employee feels valued in the company their input is valued and therefore there's a sense of responsibility and accountability they will also have in themselves because they know that their input is valued that being said there still there's still more that needs to be done both by academia both by industry players and both by we as young professionals and something things that need to be done by industry is create more opportunities we need to create more opportunities and we need to think about the word opportunities differently it won't necessarily mean just having a job some of this some of us as engineers don't want to be um, employed we want to be self employed what about these engineers being also our vendors our suppliers we teach them how to uh, provide services to us to our standard um creating opportunities in different ways um another example was we had a, a third year student a third year intern and wherever we were doing our project he wasn't able to get um he wasn't able to get a pass to go and to go to the field so what we told him to do is um he was only able to get a day pass so what he told we told him to do is he can become our photographer and he can go and take photos of our equipment and that was the first time he ever saw a cementing unit a rig we create we and what we did there was we started an interest opportunities at times may not necessarily be a job but it will be it is it can be something that can start an interest and have a ripple effect also having um field field you know field, uh, field visits where students come to the our companies and they actually see what we do they see our equipment they see what you know when we tell them let's say we pump cement what do we really mean this is the equipment that we use field visits um something else is mentorship let us mentor this young this young graduates and students let us take an opportunity and let us go the extra mile to actually mentor them when they approach us it might we might be busy but you know we can actually try and answer their questions guide them especially in getting to know how the industry is so they can be able to prepare them for the industry for the academia i would suggest and i would recommend that they introduce practical things to the syllabus so that graduates are not seeing things that we do in the field for the first time after they finish school that it should be incorporated in the syllabus the other thing would be to incorporate soft skills in the syllabus and this does not necessarily mean having a course for soft skills but it could mean for example if you're having a project have it in teams and let them present and that in that way you have been able to um see their presentation skills judge how quick they are to think of questions on their answer questions on their feet and therefore preparing them for what it actually means to be in the working world for us as young professionals let us think outside the box we are all professionals who have been trained in a different field we have some are pro, uh, some are petroleum some are chemical mechanical electrical but at the end of the day we are engineers and therefore we are trained to problem solve to have analytical skills for we are trained to think outside the box and therefore don't limit yourself to just one scope think outside the box there's so much that comes into oil and gas than just an operator just a service company there are many more other inputs and factors the other thing is mentorship i would highly suggest for you to be mentored please be mentored and get mentorship lastly there are very many um there's a lot of literature in our fingertips 
like SPE, I would really suggest that you would go and read and read more, read widely, read about what the industry is about so that you're not just green. Thank you very much. And you can reach me on my email and I am available for the Q&A sessions. Thank you very much, Lynette. I've had to rush you there uh, <laughs> with apologies, but again, uh, your presentation has hit home. Uh, you've thrown a couple of uh, provocative questions there um, to, the, uh, to academia, to companies, to the young professionals. So I'm sure they'll be coming up in the subsequent session. So thank you very much. Um, we've now covered geothermal, oil and gas, and we're now moving to mining. Our next presenter is engineer Audrey Mulama. Audrey has, a very, has had a very interesting career in mining and has also led in developing creative solutions that the industry, uh, solutions to challenges that the industry faces. This has seen her recognized as an innovator and is a recipient of the prestigious Mining 4i Innovation Award. I will now invite Audrey to tell us more about herself and about her outstanding achievement. Welcome, Audrey. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, um, I'm, well, I'm very glad to be here and I would like so much to encourage the young people. Mm, so for me, I'll just be brief. I'm a mining and mineral processing engineer. I'm the founder of KCBO, that's an environmentally focused gr uh, uh, group. And uh, I'm also an RD of the Mining for I. And besides this, I'm a Semerem beneficiary. Uh, that's a scholarship program that is run under uh, TU Berk Academy in Freiburg, Germany, and HCW Dresden in also Germany, and also Taita Tabeta University here in Voi, Kenya. So thank you so much. Please, next slide. So uh, I've been working in the industry uh, from the photos. Uh, these are geologists. And from the photo, you can see a rig site. And the other photo is uh, uh, we were conducting a rehabilitation activity on abandoned mine sites. So that is me and we are planning on having uh, what we call photo remediation using plants to actually uh, restore back uh, land that is polluted from mercury use that is so much predominant with artisanal miners. Next slide, please. So um, this is a, this is a, um, I'm, I'm being awarded for uh, the innovation I had presented on using uh, micro microorganisms as an alternative to the use of mercury, which is toxic. Next slide, please. Um, okay, uh, I think the slide has been cut short, but the photo is, is supposed to show you uh, uh, those are the effects of uh, unregulated and, you know, unregulated mines from artisanal mining activity. And we can see that so much of land is being destroyed because of mining activities in in that are not regulated and that are not, you know, up to standard that you know, mining being done by those who are not professionals. So these are the outcomes. So for our research, we are like, can we use bacteria to, you know, to restore back or to bioremediate land that has been contaminated by uh, mercury use? Next slide, please. So uh, these are our research activities. And uh, we were trying to identify microorganisms that could be used in gold extraction, which, is, which was a success. Now we are analyzing the possibility of bioremediation with, the similar, with similar strains of bacteria. Next slide, please. Uh, so from our, our uh, results, let me, say, let me call them results. Uh, these are, uh, uh, let me call it like a, a survey done on borehole uh, water assessment in various regions. And uh, you can just tell that this is beyond the World Health, the mercury levels are beyond the World Health Organization's uh, standards. So as mining engineers and as process engineers, 
we are out to solve problems and these are problems that are already, you know, they're already present there. So we're trying to see how we can solve these problems. Next slide, please. So here we have samples at the Institute of Biotechnology and Research that's in Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology, and we identified these microorganisms. Uh, next slide. And the conclusion was that we have this bacteria, we need to use it for efficient, you know, goals extraction. If miners want to do extraction there, not only for artisanal miners, they the idea can be also applied for large scale miners and uh, trying to see if these particular, partic particular microorganisms are really, uh, can be really used for bioremediation. And I welcome any Q and A's after the session. Thank you very much, Audrey. I think uh, you've been able to recover some of the time we had lost. Um, and uh, what Audrey has done is to bring to life what the young professionals are saying, that they can be part of the solutions that the industries are facing. So please involve them. Our next presenter is Hyatt Sharif. Hyatt is the first lady president of the SPE Kenyatta University chapter and despite her relatively short work experience, her abilities shine through. She is an ambitious young professional with a bright future. I now invite Haya to share her experience as a KU chapter leader and from, as well from your internships. Thank you, Hayat. Thank you, Susan, and it's an honor to be part of this panel discussion. So um, as Susan has said, I'm Haya Sharif. I recently just graduated with a degree in petroleum engineering and I have also just concluded my internship at Tallow Oil Kenya as an operations intern, and I have a passion in the extractive sector. So many people ask me why I chose the extractive sector. To be very honest, I did not choose it. I found myself in the extractive sector, and it's just a passion that developed me as I learned more about it. And I feel like the sector has so much to offer and the youth can be a part of it. And I also desire to inspire young women to take more career paths in STEM, just like I was inspired when I was younger. Um, so if I'm to answer the questions, are young professional voices being heard? I would say to some extent, yes. Um, a good example is like the picture there where it's a young professional who, an innovator, who uh, showcased his innovation to the industry and he emerged the winner of the first Energy for I. And you can see beside him is engineer Elizabeth Drogo. But I still feel that there's still so much more that can be done by both the industry and us young professionals to bridge this gap. Um, so if I'm to talk about a little bit about my experience as a student and why I say to some extent yes, I would highlight two, uh, two highlights through, from my experience. One being my internship opportunities that I have gotten um, at Savo Oil Feed Services and at Tallow Oil Kenya. And I would say from my year, the guys who graduated with me, about 90% of them were able to get internship opportunities. However, it needs to be something that's continual, that every year something happens. And the second highlight is the field trip to, to, to Turkana County, it is courtesy of Tallow Oil Kenya again, and engineer Michelle Boyd, where a group of the whole class actually got an opportunity to go and see practically what they learned in school at the field. So it's just basically now linking what you learn and seeing it practically. And if I'm to also talk about my experience as the SPE uh, president in 2018, I would highlight a few, uh, a few places where I think the industry actually got to hear more about us. One is industry events. Seminar series by Extractive Baraza. Extractive Baraza has hosted a couple of seminar series and they have never failed to invite some of us to come and uh, be part of these uh, seminars and actually share what we learned there with our colleagues back at home. Innovation opportunities, Energy for I, Mining for I, sponsored by Kipia and Extractive Baraza, where some of the young professionals and students have gotten a chance to showcase their innovations, like I said earlier. 
awards events, we have gotten a couple of opportunities, be it as volunteers or even going there to these awards events. Although I would challenge the organizers to have more awards for the young professionals. And the lastly is the East Africa uh, Petroleum Conference and Exhibition hosted by the Ministry of Petroleum and Mining in Kenya, where they sponsored a group of people again, fully sponsored trip to Mombasa, accommodation and everything to attend the seminar, uh, which was attended by so many industry players across East Africa. And they also gave some students an opportunity to showcase their technical papers. Another thing I would say is mentorship soft skills workshop, this Michelle Boit mentorship program, which has um, hosted a couple of soft skills workshop where she talks about CV writing skills and even goes ahead and, um, uh, sorry, and even goes ahead and trains some young professionals on interview skills and all that. And she also, and some experienced professionals also got uh, sponsor people to attend some events. For example, in that picture over there, Michelle Boyd mentorship program sponsored 20 people to attend a ceremony in the Upstream Awards event, which was a good networking event. I would also talk about the SPE Board of Advisors. Next slide. Um, so the SPE Board of Advisors was launched in, during the SPEKU Students Chapter, second annual gala dinner. Um, so the Board of Advisors was an initiative that I came up with uh, uh, during my time as the SPE president, and I'm proud of it. Uh, it's a group of people that basically advise the KU uh, SPE board, leadership board, like the, uh, the students board, on how they, can, how they can bridge that gap now between the SPE members and the industry. Um, I'm proud to say also Lynette Nyaga, who's part of the panelists, is part of this <laughs> board of advisors team, and she's also played a good role, and it's led by Michelle Boyd as well. Financial support, we have also managed to get some financial support from industry players, but not to, just to mention a few, Savo Oil Pit Services, Talo Oil, Baker Hughes, um, Weatherford. These are some of the organizations that have supported us, which is, which is in which we were able to put this event up together. Um, so where exactly is the gap? I would highlight five places where I feel the gap is. One is challenge for graduates. Uh, this, I've, the, Former panelists have already said there's a gap in the transition from the school to the industry. And we can talk about this more in the panel discussion. Coordination between the university and industry. Uh, and sadly, industry don't communicate their challenges to spur innovation. So I believe there's so many innovators out there. And if the industry are able to communicate the challenges that they are having, the industrial challenges that they are having, it will be able to spur so many innovations and we will move forward as an industry, as an extractive sector in all. Quality internship experience. This is just an echo of what Lynette said earlier. Um, it's not fair for young professionals or students to go for internship experiences and sit through the whole day and just do paperwork and not get engaged. Um, this is a feedback I got from a lot of my people where they said um, they, don't, they didn't feel engaged during their quality, during their internship experience. And lastly is the EBK registration, which has been a challenge for most graduates. And we can discuss this further later. So my recommendation is to where to bridge the gap from. Um, I have also categorized it into three, the industry companies, uh, to universities and to the young professionals. So to industry companies, I would say entry-level employment. Uh, there are not many entry-level employment. So we would finish campus and you would, there are so many opportunities out there, but when you see the requirements, they would say five years experience, 10 years experience. So it's something that I believe the, I believe young professionals out there are trainable and they're willing to learn and develop and to get that experience that's needed for the company graduate programs for locals in local companies. So there are a lot of graduate programs abroad and it would, it's a challenge to the industry to, I don't know, to incorporate this even in local companies in East Africa. Uh, to share industrial challenges to spur innovations, I have talked about this. I believe that if we are aware of the industrial challenges that are there, there are so many innovations that can come from it. To engage young professionals attached to the companies, we have talked about this, just get a program for internships or attachment where the young professionals or the people attached there feel engaged. So to, university, to, to universities is to invest more in research and development. Uh, I mean, funding, 
something there are so many people there like uh people we all go through our final year projects and besides that there's so many other research uh, opportunities that people have uh, the students have rather and then there's better coordination and links between the university and industry especially towards the career development side and to young professionals be open-minded your skills are applicable across the energy sector and beyond just because I studied petroleum engineering does not mean I cannot apply what I learned to school in geothermal sector. So let's just be open-minded. Let's have a global mindset. The extractive sector is beyond Kenya, beyond East Africa, beyond Africa. It's a global thing. So you can, what you learned here, you can apply it anywhere along the world. Um, learn new skills. So times are changing. Things are changing every day. Technology keeps changing. So I challenge us young professionals to move with times, to learn new softwares, learn what's, uh, what's going there, just so that you can be also be able to move with the fast facing uh, environment in the extractive sector. So um, I'll be happy to talk more about this uh, in the panel discussion. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much, Hyatt. There's no telling that you do not have actual work experience given your presentation. So we will be engaging further during the panel discussions. Thank you. Um, Susan, if I can make a comment, please. Um, just leave that screen. If anyone's having any issues with uh, resolution, there should be an option at the top that says view options. And you can um, size the presentation um, likewise. But if you still cannot see it, we will have all the presentations at the end of this webinar and we'll provide the link. Thank you, Susan. Please continue. Okay. Thank you. Our next presenter is Arthur Kisaka. Arthur is an impressive, young, confident professional. He is a current SPE Kenyatta University chapter president. In his presentation, he'll be telling us about himself and as well give us a view from the SPE. Take it away, Arthur. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I've always wanted to do, I'll, I'll dive right in. I've always wanted to do petroleum engineering uh, because it is conceptual, futuristic, and it's very practical and evident in our everyday lives. I came to settle for petroleum actually uh, after a, a lot of research. I even went as far as going to the department to actually know what is this about. It is a very new area in our region, but I found, I'm finding it to be very dynamic and ever evolving. Every now and then there is something new in the oil and gas industry. Can go to the next slide. Um, so SPKU currently uh, it was established in March 2016 and we've been in place for four years. We have been trying to ensure that the student voice is heard in the industry. And the picture right there is a cake cutting ceremony from our fourth uh, career fair. That is engineering net there smiling with a wide smile. Um, so on the lower left, we can see that we've had technical talks. That talk is actually from the Safety First Workshop by Mr. Samuel Lomondi and Peter Moriuki from Talo Oil. And we really appreciate all the professionals who come in and give us technical talks, which have been forums for knowledge transfer from experienced professionals who have supported uh, this great initiative. Also, SP has been able to equip members with skills such as project, uh, project and event planning, marketing, teamwork, and creativity through volunteering, which has been a big contributor to our success. So this is a huge part of SPE. Without the members, we cannot move forward, and volunteerism has been a big part of what we do. Um, so how do we amplify the student voice in oil and gas. Every week we've had weekly peer-to-peer -peer learning experiences where we seek to bridge the skills gap through uh, AutoCAD, programming, technical paper writing. So we are looking at how can we equip ourselves with tools that can push us forward into, uh, in the, in, into the future of petroleum engineering. Uh, on the lower left, you can see four brilliant engineers, four brilliant young engineers. These are the champions from our Kenyan Petrobol. Uh, they are Chris, uh, Koima, Inela, and Eugene. They're wearing SPE branded t-shirts. And the Petrobol is an international oil and gas trivia competition that increases knowledge of industry trends and technical facts. 
uh, these are the 20, uh, uh, I've, I've alluded, these are the 2020 winners. And uh, this year the event has been canceled, but in future we are looking to attend the event and we really need sponsorship for this. Um, on the right, you can see a very nice phone. As we know, uh, it, we, are, we are always on our phones and it is important for us to have a online presence. And one of the ways we have an online presence is through having a newsletter. It is a collection of articles from members and industry perspectives on industry per perspectives and an update on SPE activities. Actually, the next issue is, will be, is ready and will be released in the course of the week, so stay tuned and you can always book a slot for that. So how do students actually view the oil and gas industry currently and moving into the future? Uh, within our regional concept, context, sorry, uh, even though we are confident and uh, we are looking forward and we know that we are going to uh, recover our resources, the timeline is very ambiguous and dependent on multiple factors. So for us as students, it's a very unpredictable time. And uh, in, in a JPT article in 2016, uh, these, uh, the, the writer wrote that the oil industry can only predict hiring for about only six months. So it shows you the instability within the oil and gas industry, not only locally, but globally. Uh, looking at equal opportunities, issues such as local content, gender, experience can be very divisive and you can ask, we always ask ourselves as students, will I get an opportunity for career growth if I'm uh, based on my gender? Will I be uh, sidelined because I do not have experience? So these are issues that we actually look at and, and think, how can we, uh, how, is the industry providing equal opportunities for us as students? Uh, the digital and data transformation. And we, as we know right now, uh, COVID-19 has accelerated the digitization of operations, not only in oil and gas, but also other industries. And we have to equip ourselves uh, toward making a future of data-driven decisions because data and uh, virtual reality, we're seeing all these things moving into oil and gas and they're moving fast. So as engineers, we need to be at the forefront of that. Um, oil and gas in the future of energy. Right now, there's something, there's a word that's going around energy transition energy transition where we're seeing oil majors advancing uh, uh, renewable portfolios and uh, actually pushing for net zero carbon emissions like BP who was saying by 2050 they want net zero carbon. So as, as a student, how do I cast my net wide in order to fit into the energy mix of the future? Because it's not only going to be about petroleum, it's going to be about more than that. So why should you invest in students and YPs? So for uh, competence, we need to ensure competitiveness as companies, and there's a need for the next generation of engineers to be well-trained and confident in the roles that they have. So when you give us uh, opportunities, become more competent. As Hayat has alluded, oil and gas is an ever-evolving industry with efficiency and sustainability at the core of operations. And we need to be empowered. We need to be exposed to, the, to what uh, is happening in the industry for us to innovate. Uh, redefining the African industry uh, it is clear that we need to grow and nurture local content. And now more than ever, we need to transform how we do oil and gas in Africa. As the continent is growing, we also know demand will be growing. So we need to look into that. Uh, for continuity, this is the only way to ensure a hope for the future is to have a knowledge transfer from senior professionals to young professionals so that we can sustain the growth of our companies. Uh, and company reputation, and we always know that the best employees want to work for a company that supports and puts them, puts uh, effort into their career development. So we want to see companies who, uh, that are really supporting us and moving us forward. So what can we do uh, moving forward? So we can have um, industry site visits, as Engineer Linette has said. It is uh, we can all agree that seeing a picture or reading about a process can it cannot beat an, a site interactive experience. It further motivates us as students to actually go in and study and do more research into what we've just seen and what we've experienced. Our technical support, even as we plug into these technical forums, the technical sessions, as we listen to technical talks, we need a more synergetic approach uh, to spur innovation and skill growth among students. Um, on monetary support, uh, we appreciate that we've had companies that have invested in our growth, the Stalo, Baker, 
Scarvo, Oilfield Movers, Michelle Boit Mentorship Program, Weatherford, Bentworth, National Oil Well Varco, Ministry of Petroleum and Mining, and we really appreciate what they have done. Uh, although we've come up with, uh, internally, we've come up with several structures to raise funds, such as the branded merchandise, the t-shirts you saw, and also member subscription, a more consistent funding is needed for us to actually uh, do the best and give uh, students a better voice. Uh, so this is a big issue, uh, attachment and internship. For us, we really need uh, uh, industry exposure. Uh, two of them, actually two uh, attachments are needed for us to graduate. And after graduation, we need uh, to have a smooth transition. So this is a very important area. And I would like to stress that uh, in attachments and internships are actually a win-win situation. It's not just uh, us that are getting something. The companies are also getting something. As uh, Lynetta said, the project ideation, you can see when we come and uh, interact with the industry, we can understand what problems the industry is facing. We appreciate those problems and we go back to and solve those problems and come up with our final year projects, which are very uh, industry oriented and market oriented. Uh, it's a reverse mentoring opportunity. Uh, uh, reverse mentoring is a relatively new approach where both the mentor and mentee benefit professionally from each other. As we know right now, uh, as young professionals, we should equip ourselves with actually data, uh, uh, digital skills, so that even as we interact with uh, the senior professionals, we can exchange this knowledge and see how we can uh, bring that knowledge together. So on long-term partnerships, as we interact with different companies, uh, we always create connections and uh, word of mouth is very powerful, but also when I, uh, if I am attached at one company at the first time, second come, at the second time I'm attached at a different company, then I go for internship at a different company and uh, it's very easy for me to create lasting connections so that we can have long-term sustenance of our industry. Thank you. You can always contact me, those are my contacts. And as you can see to the right, that's a picture from Bentworth. They were at our fourth annual career fair. They, were, they had some exhibits. So that's also how you can also support students. Thank you. Susan? So thank you very much. We had one gentleman in the amongst the presenters and he's done as uh, proud, um, Arthur. Um, he will be speaking again, so I will not uh, belabor any point right now. And uh, Liz, I think you'll take over the sharing. Yes, um, if you're able to pull up the, the, the survey, I think we can look at the survey when we're, um, when we're uh, in the discussion phase so that we can have a little bit of a break. I want to say congratulations to the panelists. You all did a very good job. I've been getting one, wonderful comments. We have lots of questions um, um, that we'd like to get through. So let's hurry. I think we'll give ourselves about 30 minutes or so to get through this. And um, yes, Susan, are you going to share the... Yes, so Arthur, would you like to just quickly go through this? Um, I think it's six pages of this yes. uh, survey that you did and explain to the participants um, why you did this. And please just give us three minutes on this. Okay. So um, we carried out an anonymous survey to actually understand what our members feel, because I can, uh, we, we can do presentations, but we cannot uh, capture the full picture of what uh, uh, young professionals feel. And uh, these are some of the demographics that we had. We had um, a huge number of uh, graduates, we categorize them into two, the yellow and green, and uh, the senior undergraduates in the purple. So you can go to the next slide so we can look at some amazing facts that we got from the data. You can see that 50% of the graduates who took the survey are employed. 56% have interacted with upstream oil and gas companies, and 25% ENP, 31% service companies. So we, we have a feel of uh, most of uh, our respondents are talking about an upstream, we're giving an upstream perspective. A 60% approval rating on the attitude of companies towards young professionals and students. 41% um, of respondents feel companies have put effort into their career development. So that's actually less than 50%. Uh, can you go to the next one? 
So what have companies done? Uh, we picked some uh, responses, uh, just as they were. So on training, there's a respondent who said, I was taken for further studies, which is something uh, the, the respondent is currently employed. And we can see that company is really supporting them. Uh, another employee said, employees were more than willing to share knowledge with me. So we can see that some mentorship is happening during industrial attachments. So a company perspective, this was a very interesting uh, perspective from a young professional. They're saying it is hard to invest in students when the market is down. We try our best, but our primary objective is to build a successful business. The current low global demand for oil and gas products cannot absorb the available workforce for the oil and gas industry. So that's a perspective we should always uh, have in mind, even as we champion for uh, young professionals to get uh, empowered. So uh, the attitude, I'll start with the positives. Uh, they are very helpful professionals willing to teach us and mentor. Another said our supervisors were willing to share their expertise and did not did their best to expose us to opportunities that would prove beneficial. Willingness to train and provide training opportunities. So you can see that when, once students get uh, a feel of what is in the industry, they, they find a lot of mentorship, a lot of help within the industry. Um, then the negatives, very few companies are there and it's difficult to get in touch with them. Just very few get in touch. So that's something I think the companies can really work on. Although many companies have expressed a commitment to support young professionals, they've been unable to offer these opportunities, uh, leaving us on the outside looking in. I think we can look at the, perspe just the, the perspective from the company. We can look at the company perspective from that comment. Uh, unhealthy competition. There is no exposure even from older peers, lack of acceptance. So some of the recommendations from those currently employed, they want to be mentored in their careers and be allowed to steer projects with small teams in preparation for major projects. The recent graduates are saying we want internships, uh, we want companies to be receptive to our ideas and companies to provide timely feedback or respond whenever we try to reach them. Because guys send out CVs, they send out, they try to communicate, but no responses. Our students are saying offers internship opportunities and support innovation like Energy for I by Keep Here. I also hold more seminars to help interact with uh, those already in industry. So that's just a brief and you can, I think it's very conclusive. Yes, thank you very much, Arthur. Again, Arthur took the initiative to conduct the survey I'm in preparation for today's session. So well done, Arthur. I think the results have been well articulated. So I'll hand over back to our moderator, and that is uh, engineer Elizabeth Rogo. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, thank you, Susan. Could you, oh, we're back, back online. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. The comments we're getting are just amazing. Um, we are going to go straight into the discussion phase. We will um, put 30 minutes to that, and uh, hopefully we can shut down on time. I'm seeing somebody raise their hand, Melba. You raised your hand. Can you type um, your comment or question because I can't, I can't see you. Okay, um, I'd like to start off with Lynette. Lynette, Alan Mugisha, who we all know well, ex-Talo in Ghana, I'm assuming that's the same Alan. Um, he asked the question that he's seen lots of oil companies laying off employees due to a combination of COVID-19 and the low oil prices. These layoffs seem to be cyclical, as we saw previously. What would be your advice to students who are just about to make career choices into the industry? Lynette? Um, I, would, I would advise students to equip themselves with other skills and to be more versatile. So practical examples, you can be an engineer and still be a HSC specialist. So when engineering roles are down, you can still be a HSC specialist. There is nowhere where an oil and gas company works without a HSC specialist. So you can wear both hats. You can be also uh, play a role of, you can be an engineer and also work as a support in the support function. So whether it's logistics or procurement, so be versatile as an engineer, because also during what this COVID thing has taught us is companies will be more lean. So the more versatile you are as an engineer, the better. Excellent, excellent comments. 
Susan, I'm going to pull you in as, as the practitioner. Um, you've seen, as you well know, even at Tullow, people are leaving. How would you, um, what advice would you give the young engineers? Without wanting to repeat what Lynette has said, I'd say let's drop the oil and gas uh, is, is everything to us and it's our aspiration and I'm guilty of that as well. Uh, let's consider other industries that can help us continue utilizing the skills that we have learned because the skills are still with you. The experience is what you need to continue gaining because that's what is going to prepare you for the next job whenever the industry may turn around. But I'd also say, um, picking on a point that Phyllis made, that um, geothermal and uh, oil and gas have similarities. The rigs that are used are similar. I think it's just the, the one uses compression, the other one uses mud. And therefore, geothermal is an area that can go. It's a developing area. Yeah, the country is, um, is, is uh, bragging about being seventh um, globally, but who knows what more could be done. There's still acreage that needs to be explored that will be able to take on uh, the young uh, professionals. So I would say think broader. The, the presenters have said think globally, um, think beyond your industry. So that remains, I think, the, the message that I want to reiterate as well as a practitioner. Thank you. And, and that's very true. I, I, I put together a seminar at the beginning of the, of the year and brought in petroleum engineers and I was shocked the majority of them told me they never considered geothermal as an alternative to oil and gas. Um, so that was a, an excellent point, Phyllis, that you brought up. Um, does anyone want to come make an, any other comment? Otherwise, we'll move on because we've got lots of questions. Um, so the next question, and this is actually something that I've been thinking about from Gilbert Gibichi. He asked, what are the chances of an engineer graduate with a disability to join the extractive industry, especially oil and gas, noting that the service industry um, in the recruit, recruitment statement always says working environment free of discrimination and all we all know what else they say you know how will your company place a graduate with a with a disability that's an excellent question uh, gilbert I, um arthur i'd like you to address that because you were very big on the technology side uh, so as you're moving forward the yeah right now we, we're experiencing uh, situations where people are working virtually so I'm sure depending on the disability, you can place yourself at a, you can position yourself well to add value to a company uh, in, a play, in a position where your disability is not a hindrance to how you perform. When you're looking at uh, digital and data transformation, uh, you come to coding. You, when you code, you don't need much. You just need your fingers and your eyes and, is, and you're good. Uh, when it comes to virtual reality, when it comes to analysis of a reservoir simulation. You don't need uh, people to be there, but you can work virtually and you can also uh, position yourself well with, with these auxiliary skills that will actually make you of value to the company. So uh, Audrey, within the mining sector, how, how do they address this, um, this issue with disability? Have you come across it? Yeah, uh, thank you, Engineer Elizabeth Rogo, for your question. I can remember as far as when we were students, we had um, students with disabilities and they are, they are actually involved. They're involved in mine, but not per se in the field work. Yeah, because of, uh, and also it, it depends with the company. If, if your company right now is doing exploration and uh, and uh, maybe perhaps they can avail the various uh, infrastructure for the for the particular person. That is very possible. But uh, for folks who have not seen anybody with a disability being discriminated or anything, for us, uh, I think for the for the sector it's very involving, and it's also very good if other other you know variety and diversity is also put in place whenever we're in the working place. Yes. Yes. So Gilbert, uh, please don't take the, the fact that the oil industry may be very strict on the disability side because it's all to do with safety. And I don't think it's there, there to say because you have a disability, we do not want you. There's many other ways that um, a person with the said condition, as you rightfully said, um, can, can join. Um, does, if anyone else wants to make a, a comment, otherwise I can move on. Phyllis, in uh, geothermal. 
Yeah, um, well, good evening, everyone. So about uh, persons living with disability, we understand that they might be going through challenges uh, as opposed to every other person. However, we must understand that uh, this is a very interesting field, a very specific field, and health and safety is very, very important. So besides you getting the job, you must understand that you must be safe to work in such situation. So in cases, where you're not able to be in field work. It doesn't mean you're less of an engineer, but you can do engineering, but still in office. We actually have a few people who are engineers who are not able to work in field work, but they can do other engineering activities and design work, but from office. Uh, me, me, bearing in mind that your safety is very, very important and it cannot be compromised in either geothermal or in oil and gas. I believe it can't. So it is just to place yourself in a place where you're able to give your best while putting yourself in the best position so that you are safe to actually work and to deliver. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I have a question for Hayat from Alan Gisha. Thank you, Alan. Do you, and uh, as well as Arthur, do you have any analysis that co correlates the internships provided by organizations to actual employment? In, in other words, are we seeing a trend that informs us that internships eventually translate into employment? That's a very good question. Hayat? Yeah, that's a good question. And I would say, um, not necessarily. The, like from what we have seen, not all internship opportunities, people who go for internship, it will eventually translate into employment um, for, for a couple of reasons. One, um, most people do this internship while they're in, still in school in their third year or fourth year before they even complete their school. So it's just a short term internship just to practically learn for that short period. So it, it won't be practical to uh, hire this person as a permanent employee uh, and yet they still need to go back to school. And if we look at after, how about after they finish school? I don't know, if, are the companies, I don't know if the company has the capacity to actually um, have this person as an employee because you might find that it has the capacity to have five interns but only employ one person or not even have any employment opportunities so it also depends on the company that you're interning for and and the capacity or and you as a person you as an internship and at what stage you went for your internship okay thank you and Arthur I think uh, there has been a low attrition rate uh, getting into companies because of also the current situation in the country. Uh, looking at uh, operations are not consistent and some, most people are getting contractual jobs. So it's very hard to find people who are actually employed currently, especially in upstream. Mm -hmm. So Phyllis, I want to ask you, how, do, um, how does the internship program run in GDC? Because I never see any notices and maybe you can help us here. Well, we have uh, been taking interns in the rigs um, with time and especially with the circumstances and what's going on, the numbers have reduced. Uh, usually we advertise on our website, that's www.gdc.co.ke and we, we, we advertise, we get some interns. But the other challenge we have is even when we get interns, only a few of them are very serious about learning. I do not know if some of you in field work have experienced that, but we have had very good participants. I think there was one who was in KU and I think was an official of SP called Guria, who was very good. But then you have others who are just there, it's like to pass time. So it depends. The other thing I find is that some of the interns do not network. It is just to come, do your job and go home. The thing is, Part of internship is so that you are able to meet the people working there. And you do not know where those people uh, who you are working with in the company you are interning in will be today or tomorrow. Or you do not know who you are second, third, their second, third, or fourth connections are. So you find that most of the interns will just keep to themselves, do the job what they are given, don't ask much, much questions, and go home. And then just a small percentage are the ones who are much interested in, in actually the activity you are doing. What you must understand as an intern, and what I did know when I was an intern, is that when I go and I am working with someone, that person has to meet a deadline and do their job. So it is my business to make sure that I learn. And when the mentor or the person who is mentoring you realizes that you're actually willing to learn, they are more willing to help you. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's yeah, they are, they are more willing to help you. Thank you. So Audrey, what about in the mining uh, sector? What are you experiencing? 
in terms of internships? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, in the mining sector, we have uh, diverse fields. We have quarrying, we have blasting, we also have exploration, and uh, the, 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 actually the, for, the opportunities are there, but we feel that they are limited because we don't have much investors coming in from other countries investing in, in this particular, uh, you know, field. So, um, the investment, uh, uh, it depends also with the investment uh, temperature in the country and for, and also for these opportunities, they are available, but depending with the investment opportunities that are available in the country. Yeah. But we do internships and, uh, and also attachments, but we feel that the internships and attachments should be, you know, producing quality. Even when you're going for an attachment, you should, you should challenge yourself that I'm doing an attachment that is actually producing a quality competent engineer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, the, the other question that was raised, and I want to try and get rid of most of the questions and then we'll move on. With the extractive industry so volatile, and this is from some, an anonymous person, is, is it right to advise future, cons, uh, future engineers to consider maybe another industry? What's your take? Anyone? Uh, Lynette, maybe? Wow. Um, yeah, yes. Yes, I would, but I would tell them to be versatile. I would tell them to really think beyond just, you're coming in as an engineer and your only focus is to be an engineer. Companies are growing. So if, if, we, don't get, um, if we don't get people, we also won't grow as companies. So yes, I think that they should come, but the approach in which um, students um, should come into the industry, graduates should come into the industry, will differ from the way it used to be before. They need to be more versatile. So Susan, chip in whenever. I'm just going through these questions, if there's anything. Um, Hayat and, and um, Arthur, I think both of you may answer this on different perspective. I do understand local students have a chance to join their SME chapters and join the industry. What about international students? Um, okay, time to start off. Um, SPE is an international organization. It's just not in Kenya or in Africa. And uh, so you can, you can find out if there's SPE in your country or in your region and how you can be part of that SPE where you are. And if you're in Kenya and if your university, your student's chapter has a degree or has a course in petroleum engineering or a related course, um, I would ask that you you uh, you form an SPE chapter there, and then you can engage other young professionals or other students over there. But uh, SPE is also not just for students, it's for also professionals. So um, you can check out the SPE website to find out more about SPE, but you can join SPE in your region, in your country. And so if just, it's not there, yeah. yeah. Just to make it clear, in, within Kenya, we have the SPE Nairobi chapter, that's geared more to the professionals, then you have the SPE Kenyatta University. It's the uh, SPE which, Nairobi section. Nairobi section. section. Yeah, and SPE Kenya, so the students chapter falls under the section, the Nairobi section. Oh, so correct. we can have other student, student chapters that come under the section. Okay. So Arthur, let me just move on. I think um, Hyatt has, has answered that question. Um, Arnold Nyaga is asking, are there any mentorship programs for both students and graduates in the local chapters of the SPE here in Kenya? Yes, there, there is a pilot mentorship program that we are running currently. It is uh, run by John Mwakio as the secretary of the Nairobi section. We are trying to get uh, professionals from uh, the Nairobi section and students from the Kenyatta University student chapter to come together and uh, model a, a mentorship program. We've started with six students and we'll keep growing it. It's a six months program. So after six months, uh, the mentor and the mentee will be on their own now, not under the SPE bubble, so that if they want to grow uh, professionally, they can keep growing. Uh, but we offer six months uh, incubation period for our mentorship, pro for our mentorship program. And we, we are, we are keep the, we'll keep growing it over time. 
That's excellent. I, I didn't even know, know about it. Um, so Arnold, if you need more information, please get a hold of Arthur, who's the SPEKU chapter president, and he can uh, provide more information. There's an anonymous question that came through, and I think, Phyllis, I'd like to direct that to you. Um, it says, um, how can non-engineering professionals in the oil and gas industry, I'll also say geothermal or mining or the energy sector as a whole, thrive career-wise when they are not considered key professionals? Who said they're not considered key participants? Yes, uh, yes I agree, but uh, yes. So we need to yeah. clarify that point. So uh, I think what we must understand as young professionals is that um, do not dismiss yourself. That's the first thing. Who said you're not needed? Yeah. You must participate and it is necessary that you participate and do what you're doing and do it well. The thing is, um, uh, the fact that uh, both geothermal, oil and gas are heavily technical industries does not mean that we do not need other ex experts. We need HR, we need communication people, we need even chefs. It's a whole industry comprising of very many other people. It's just that we tend to talk more as scientists and engineers about the industry because we are the one actively doing the job, but we have a lot of support. But you need to be good at what you do. You need to be the best HR person. You need to be the best communication person. You need to be the best chef. You need to be the best driver. Yeah, that is how you participate. And do not dismiss yourself. Do not feel like the engineer is doing more than you can do or is doing a more creamier job. No, make yours your cream, make yours your best, run with it and let us see your best expertise while at it. That's what I would say. So Phyllis, let me ask you something. When, when you did your degree in electrical um, and okay. el electronics engineering, you never ever thought you'd be a drilling engineer um, at GDC. So what, yeah. so, yes, so how did you make that, how did you make that transition? Just very quickly. What inspired you along the way? So so I got in as an electrical, as a rig maintenance engineer, and basically we were doing a lot of uh, wholesome maintenance of equipment, ensuring uh, availability of equipment for use by the operations people. And while I was working as a rig maintenance engineer, I looked and watched what the operations people were doing. And I really loved it. And I felt like it was more spontaneous. And I felt like it's something I would do. And I remembered that I was given the power to do what, to read and to do what pertains to my degree. And I started reading. And that is how I transitioned. I developed an interest. I developed an interest. I worked on it. And I moved. And when the opportunity came, I requested and I shifted. That was mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that's a that's a, fan, a, a fantastic point. I think um, you have to take ownership of your career. I, I hear a lot of interns coming in, and as you said, there are those who just sit and want to be spoon-fed, and those that are very, very curious. The more curious you are, the better the opportunities are. And don't even, even if somebody tells you, you can't do this at this time, there are always many doors or many routes to get to where you need to get to. Um, I wouldn't say much about my own experience because otherwise it'll take another two hours. Um, but you make some, some excellent points uh, in terms of these soft skills. You have the degree, but then you have to have the, um, the capability. You have to have the determination. You have, to, you, you have to just do what you need to do. You have to know that I want to be president of an oil company. What will it take? for me to get there. That's the, those are the sort of dreams that you must have. Those are the sort of goals you must have. And if you want to be, I want to be a field engineer for the rest of your life, kudos to you. You have to be happy with what you want to do. Um, and here's another interesting question uh, that I want to give you, Susan. While there's a lot of talent across the continent, and this comes from Ruth Z Zerezgi, um, while there's a lot of talent across the continent, there are also many people in the diaspora who are interested in returning or working on African projects from a distance. As the diaspora continues to grow, what do you think the role of the, of the diaspora members to be? Conversely, can you also discuss brain drain in these particular sectors? Susan? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Liz. That's a good question, um, Ruth. It's actually one that I was thinking uh, Liz was going to take, <laughs> having come from the diaspora. <laughs> but I will, I will chime in now and then you can, uh, you, you, you can close it maybe. Um, so 
I'll speak it perhaps more from a local content perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, most countries that um, are starting to explore or exploit their reserves, their oil and gas reserves, um, are looking at uh, people who can come in and uh, do the work, and more so if they're national. Um, and I think this is definitely an, an opportunity for those in the diaspora because you have the experience, I'm sure that's what you're doing out there, and uh, you're able to come in and uh, hold your own, if you like, yeah? Uh, and you can therefore be able to push the projects forward. In terms of working from a distance, perhaps I'd see this more from uh, uh, jobs that do not require you to be on the ground, and uh, perhaps those will be more from a consulting perspective, or um, if you're working in a consortium, then there are particular roles that you can take that would allow you you know, to, to be, to, uh, not to be on the ground, yeah? Therefore, to be virtual, if I may put it that way. So I'd say there's definitely um, room for that. Um, there's definitely potential for the diaspora um, Africans to get back to their countries to support them. Because um, as we're looking at the COVID situation, we also realize that um, it, it may be a challenge getting international flights opening up and as well our borders opening up. So how can you in the diaspora, being nationals of the, of the countries where, um, that have the, the projects, how can you support them in, in terms of also meeting the local content requirements? Because we're seeing governments pushing for local content and indeed it's a good way to go because um, unless we focus on local content and we don't start developing people who can sustain the projects that are coming up in our areas. Um, the brain drain uh, um, scenario in these particular sectors, I think, is, has been there and um, not for a bad reason because these, in the, these sectors that we've discussed are just growing now um, and more so professional, professionalizing now, looking at mining as well. Um, what that tells me is that you went out there, you seized opportunities to develop yourself, to work in areas which are already advanced in technology, in doing what they're doing, and therefore, as the as the continent starts opening up, there's nothing that stops you from coming back and owning that space. Because I think that's part of what was, uh, was done earlier on. Um, Post-colonialism, uh, uh, we saw people who went out to study and they were being developed to come back and take over positions to be able to lead the government. So I see, I see a, um, some similarity between what may have happened in these sectors and as well what may have happened in the post-colonial times. So by all means, own that space, look for those opportunities, look for roles that can enable you to work, to operate from out there, and also companies that are happy with you, you know, operating from out there. But again, I think the COVID situation has allowed us another new dimension to what may present uh, Mui Africans an opportunity to, to build and to sustain local content. Thank you. I'll just say briefly on my, on my side, I, I am one of those who came out of the diaspora, but it took me five years to get back from where I was internationally to hit the shores of is it the yeah the shores of of of, of Kenya and and make my way into East Africa, but that was something that I desired and and it it, it was something I had to work through and it's not always easy. Let me tell you, I I, I can tell you that in the first uh, six months I was ready to pack my bags very many times to go back to where I came from uh, because I I didn't have that okay I had my family but I didn't have friends um, you know things were very different. I had to learn a new way of, of things being done. Even though, yes, I'm Kenyan, Kenyan born, it was, it was foreign to me. So you, there are challenges, but then I had to find a network and then decided, you know what, I'm going to make a go of it. And, uh, and this is where I am. But today is not about me. Um, Audrey, I want to shift the conversation a little bit to, to you and the reason why you did your presentation the way you did, because we wanted to bring in that innovation and, and that also stepped into the, into the arena of entrepreneurship as well. And I like the fact that you wanted to discuss what you had come up with, um, this new technology, um, you know, um, to, to improve the environment, especially for uh, mercury poisoning. Um, what drove you? What drove you to look for a solution? Because you could have easily gone to Acacia and said, you know what, that's your problem, not mine. Um, okay, thank you so much for your insight. Uh, what really inspired me was the, you know, it's it's a problem that you're seeing in the in the environment. It's a problem you're seeing in your daily life. It's a problem you're seeing in your community, and uh, 
you don't see anybody, even the, the stakeholders who are concerned. When you talk to NEMA, that is the National Environmental Management uh, Association, they're not really not involved. They're not, not you know, they, they're not putting up the initiative to stop the use of mercury. When you talk to the ministry, they don't have alternatives. When you talk to, uh, you know, the stakeholders who are in charge, the authorities, the mining authorities who are responsible for this, they don't put in any insensitives, I mean, initiatives. So what really inspired me was, you know, mercury being handled by children, mercury being handled by pregnant women and women uh, of bearing age, uh, of children bearing age. So it, it was a need that I felt that should be addressed. And for that particular uh, need, you know, as an engineer, you're a leader, you need to put in an innovation or put in an, uh, you know, some initiative where you're able to solve problems because that is what engineering is. It's about solving problems. And as engineers, as leaders, we have to focus also on the environmental aspects in oil and gas, uh, in mining alternatives or what initiatives that are and eco-friendly can be put in because we are seeing so much, you know, racism in the world, you know, tribalism, and these issues because there is an imbalance in the in the industry. And as engineers, if we stand up and tackle these problems, we can be able to, you know, to solve these issues once and for all. You know, you are the idea people. You are the people who have the bingo. You know, the bullseye, the eureka. So I feel that's that's something we should not just take for granted and we step up to the challenge and solve these issues once and for all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. I'm going to do one more question and then we will go to the um, your one minute closing statement. But I see we're a little bit over time. And this comes from an anonymous attendee. I like this. The panel has mostly ladies. This is the first time when I'm very pleased about this uh, compared to the gentlemen. Uh, if you look at the Michelle Boyd mentorship program, is, is, she, is she mentored? Savo Oil Field Services and Bentworth all have uh, female leads who are taking part in mentoring activity active, actively. Do the male pro professionals care less about mentorship? Arthur, do you want to discuss that? Arthur. You put me in a spot. <laughs> Um, it's not that male professionals uh, uh, do not want to support. They have supported. Uh, actually, SPE this year, we've had a great support. I can mention a few engineers. James Mwangi has been uh, supporting us. Uh, Wendy Anyaga is a great supporter of uh, student development and mentorship. Uh, engineer Matthew Waita is a great supporter. Uh, we have engineer Kennedy Yugi. We have Samuel Omundi from uh, Talo. Who have really supported us. So I, I think it's not that there's a lack of them, it's just that uh, we are not seeing them right now, but uh, you'll see them more and more as we move on. Yes, we're a very inclusive uh, in, uh, industry, so not to worry. This time we're highlighting the women, and, and it wasn't intentional, by the way. A couple of the men dropped out. But um, I'd like to take this time now for each of you to give your closing statement before we lose everybody. Um, who would like to start first? Phyllis. Maybe we start with you. So just about a minute each, please, everyone. Phyllis, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think I have learned more than I have shared. This has been a very good initiative. Thank you to the organizers. I look forward to many more. I'll just leave uh, by saying that uh, the time to act and to take the next step is now. And now is right now. And right now is right right now. So whatever it is that you've got, maybe write it down on paper so you remember. The enemy of good, of better, is good. Sometimes you get, you're, you're good at what you do, but you get comfortable. Good is the enemy of better. Try to be better at something. You are as ignoble as the goals you set in your mind. So dream big. Dream get better. Let your dreams scare you such that when you close your mind, you are scared of what is ahead of you and you get the energy to be able to reach it. Thank you so very much. I've learned uh, from, uh, a lot from you all and I hope that we shall be interacting more on this. Thank you. Phyllis, thank you very much. We're very honored to have a, a leading lady from Geothermal, a leading lady in engineering, and I know you'll definitely go far with those wings that you already have. 
as the ambassador for Kenya. Thank you. Um, Lynette, would you like to follow? Okay, thank you very much. I, I said in my presentation, think outside the box, but let us assume there is no box. So don't limit yourself at all. Let there be nothing that limits you, whether it's gender, whether, as Philly says, um, falling, you know, falling short, selling yourself short, assume that there's no boundary, there's no box. Don't look at uh, Kenya and uh, Mozambique, don't look at the boundaries that are there, geographical boundaries, there is no box, and think about it like that. Thank you. Thank you, Lynette. Thank you. You're another phenomenal engineer. Um, we worked in the same company, Baker Hughes. So it's really nice to see the younger ones that have come up and then to see that you are a leader in, in the true sense. And I know Bentworth is very lucky to have you. Thank you. Um, next, we will have Hayat. Would you like to give your statement? Yes, this has been such an insightful panel discussion. And I think I would close by just urging the young professionals that they should speak out. They should speak out the challenges they are facing. And if they're, and they feel like they're not heard, they should speak louder. And if they still feel like they're not heard, they should shout until we are able to be heard, until our concerns are heard out there. And to the industry, when we knock, it's really discouraging to know whether there's someone on the other side <laughs> or not. So listen to our calls. And yeah, um, I think this is a good start to, this conversation is a good start to a great future for young professionals and for the industry. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Engineer Audrey, please. Hello. Um, yes, for me, uh, I've, I've learned a lot. I've, I feel networking among engineers, this should be a platform for networking, not only, you know, local and, and international networking of engineers, because I feel the engineers are the ones who have the say when it comes to ideas. And also, uh, I feel encouraged and I also like to encourage the rest uh, to pursue whatever fields that they're really comfortable with and they're really inspired to pursue. Uh, the sky is not the limit. The stars are not even the limit. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, engineer, and continue with innovating all the way and um, and making sure that we have less polluted mining operations. I'm so proud of you. I was on the panel that selected you when you won your your first award, and I know there are many many to come. And for those who have sponsored you, you have a bright a bright lady in front of you. We're all proud of you. So uh, Arthur, the man here, you can close out this, se this session for us. Um, so thank you very much for this uh, session. Uh, what I would advise students is uh, to plug in, plug in into such opportunities, plug into the webinars, plug into SPE, make sure that your voice is loud enough by plugging in and ensure that you know as much as possible about your industry, understand where the industry is headed because you, you are part of that future. And if you do not know what future you're going into, how will you know how to transform yourself into in, uh, in for that future? Uh, for the companies, we have platforms. SPE is a platform where you can invest in students. It's a platform where you can get information about students. You can reach out to us, you can reach out to the university. SPE and the Department of Petroleum are one. When you reach out to us, you reach out to the department and we reach out to you. Please listen, please tell us, give us some feedback. Uh, if sometimes our, our, our rates are too high, you can always tell us, hey, this is what we can afford and we'll come to a compromise. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And my dear co-moderator who I've really enjoyed having and I think you were the, the right person for this uh, session, would you like to give your closing statement? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Engineer Elizabeth. Um, I think the young, the young professionals, or the youth, if I can use that word, are definitely underrepresented. The great minds we have heard today are just a representation of who else is out there. And um, therefore, I think they've challenged themselves in terms of some of their see the opportunities to be able to step up and uh, speak up and speak out. Um, whenever the forums come, because we've seen that you know what the challenges are. You are capable of also coming up with solutions. And you're also capable 
of coming up with innovative solutions as we have seen from Audrey. So the industry is still, is, is still young, relatively young compared to other parts of the world. What I would say is that take on that space again and let's see what you can transform Africa to become. Thank you. It was a pleasure working with all of you. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for the audience that has also shot up uh, questions that the panel was very able to handle. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, panelists. You've done a fantastic job. We're definitely going to have another um, youth, uh, young professional seminar. There's so much to, uh, to be said. I also want to thank our panelists, those that have stayed with us through this length of time. I know we've gone uh, a little bit over, but you could see that there's a lot more that we could discuss. Thank you for all the questions. I know we didn't answer everyone's question, but we will try to get back to you afterwards. Please, please, please send a, um, any questions and your email addresses to chantal.ongaro at gmail.com. Uh, I've been seeing her quite active on the chat box. And also, um, you will see a link where all the presentations will be available uh, for you to, to view. If you have any questions, the Africa Energy Chamber is here to help. Um, I support or look after the, uh, re the East Africa section, but I'm supported by a wonderful group, the main group that sits in South Africa. So if I can't answer anything or, or I have any issues, I can always turn to them um, to help. We are here, we are the voice of, of the industry, especially the African industry. We want everyone to know that there's potential, we want everyone to see this young potential that, that we have. I am extremely proud. I'm actually tearing up just looking at, looking at, at the example of, of what's coming uh, coming behind us. I'd also be remiss if I didn't say a big thank you to our, our sponsors, and that is Norwell Edge from Aberdeen, Mike Adams in particular, who has been uh, really, really passionate about educating the youth and has found a platform in which to do it. Please, everyone, take advantage. The young professionals, send us your contacts. I want you to all be there. And also for Africa, uh, the African Energy Chamber for hosting, uh, Mandisa Nduli and her team. Uh, Mandisa is the Director for Marketing and Communication. We couldn't have done this uh, without them. Um, lastly, I just want to wish everyone uh, you know, good health. Um, um, please, we've got more exciting webinars coming up from the Africa Energy Chamber. I'd also like you to, um, to join us. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a membership drive that's going on. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me at Elizabeth at energychamber.org, elizabeth at energychamber.org. And those who are looking for jobs, who are looking for internships, please do not be discouraged. Uh, it doesn't mean that you call me at, at midnight looking for a job, it, it happens, or you, you, you send me uh, funny, funny uh, um, letters. Uh, believe you me, I read each and every letter that comes in. I try to respond to as many as I can. I know things have slowed down, but the industry will turn around. This COVID pandemic is not here forever. We will manage it and we need energy and whatever form this energy is, be it fossil fuel, be it geothermal, solar, or whatever it is, we all have a role to play. I thank you again, everyone. I wish you God's blessing and until we meet again. Thank you. <laughs>